Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman, here as always with Tom or Tom. How's it going? Oh, Tony. This is one of these weeks where you can kind of feel everyone in Columbus going, why, why isn't it Saturday yet? Like, I mean, this is Columbus has always sort of lived up to the uh, drinking town of the football problem uh, T-shirt that you, they used to sell. But this is one of those weeks where it's like, man, you can really you can feel it around town that this is, you know, Western Kentucky is not on the schedule this week. It is uh, it is Notre Dame time. You can definitely feel the drinking time. Yes, you are correct. So uh, before we get to Notre Dame, we want to take our, our weekly look back at the previous opponent after a rewatch of Ohio State and Western Kentucky. Just talk about the stuff that we found on the rewatch. It's not always easy to see what is going on live and uh, f- especially for you on the field, me in the press box with Kevin in my ear talking to me about like laundry and the <laughs> Cowboys. So it's like enough with the laundry and the Cowboys plays. I'm trying to watch football. Not the Dallas Cowboys either. Just like, man, you know what I wanted to be when I grow up? No, Kevin, what is it? No. <laughs> and, then he, and then he gets distracted by something shiny. Yeah. If, if I have to hear about Louis L'Amour one more time from this guy, <laughs> I'm going to have it. Uh, so, yeah, Western Kentucky went back. We both went back. We watched it. Some of the things that we took away from – the broadcast edition and getting an, an opportunity to uh, also clarify or um, confirm some of the things that I think we saw live. But first for me, I will just say this. And the first note I wrote on here is that Ohio state can't use a Mecca Abuka enough. And they're finding some ways to do that. Some quick stuff, some, some shorter stuff, but obviously he's also a guy that can be used deep. And I think we'll continue to see that, but I, I like him in that slot as a as a jet sweep guy. Like throw some screens to him. I don't think, like I said, I don't think they can use him enough. He had uh, four four catches in this one, four targets. I don't. It's it was it, they they scored sixty three points. It was enough, you know. And fifty six of those or forty nine of those points came on offense. So so it was enough. But I think moving forward, if if he's um, – where would he be? Like maybe number three in total touches behind the leading running back, Marvin Harrison, and then Emeka Buka. I think he is that much of a difference maker and that much of a pain for defenses. Like get him the ball, the ball as much as you can and see what happens. And I think the thing that makes him so valuable to Ohio State is, yeah, he's you know obviously incredibly talented. He's very productive when you get him the ball. But Marvin Harrison, like a lot of teams have one good cornerback, one really good cornerback. And with Marvin Harrison being Marvin Harrison, you know, sometimes they're going to line him up in a spot where he is not matched up with that guy. And that generally goes poorly for the other team. But, you know, when the other team has its druthers, they're going to have their number one corner on Marvin Harrison. When the number two corner is a big drop off from the number one corner, the number two wide receiver for Ohio State is not a big drop off from the number one wide receiver. That sets you up with some interesting matchups. And, you know, either Abuka or Harrison is going to be on the other team's number two rece- uh, corner. That is, you know, that's that's how, unless you can clone people, that's how it's going to work pretty much every game this season. He just, he's so reliable. He, you know, when they had the fourth down uh, in the first, well, what, first drive or, or second drive of the game, where does where does Kyle McCord go? He's just airmailed the pass to Julian Fleming. It's fourth down. He's a little bit, you know, it just it would be understandable if he was a little bit nervous or whatever. And then he just he zips one into a buka. That, that ended up being a really nice pass. That was one of my notes. So I guess I'll just sort of talk. I touch on that right now. My you know watching live, I thought, oh boy, you know he he airmailed Fleming on third down. And then he went, you know, Abuka really had to go up for it. And boy, that was, you know, I wonder if he's, you know, if that's nerves or what's going on with him. And then you watch on the replay and uh, there is a safety or a linebacker or someone cutting underneath there. And that ball, you know, we talk about the one inch drill that they run in practice all the time. He didn't quite one inch him, but he maybe six inched him getting it over that underneath defender high enough that Abuka could go up and get it and pick up a first down. But yeah, that's, that's just one of those things that Abuka can do. He, uh, you know, had and then had two touchdowns in quick succession right at the end of the first half. Just boom, boom, 
two big plays, two different plays, but uh, you know, beat beat the defenders, you know, pretty cleanly and easily on both of them. That throw, I was, I want to know, and maybe if we talk to Kyle McCord this week, I can ask because I, I wonder if he saw that defender flashing at that point because it was a high throw. And that is definitely not the intent of the one inch drill because they're using touch on that one. And this was not touch. This was just, this was zipped and it was a great catch by uh, Emeka Abuka. And I, I agree that one stood out to me because watching it live, it seemed like it was an inaccurate throw. Now I'm wondering if it was like extremely accurate because he had to keep it away from the defender. I do think, uh, it was pretty funny. The pass before that, the one that was airmailed to Julian Fleming, I saw a replay on Twitter of Ryan Day's reaction on the sideline where he said, basically, it was wide blanking. Or he's wide blanking open and uh, just talking to himself or, you know, anybody else in his, his headset. And I thought that was funny. And then, you know what? He, he missed that pass badly and then they went right back to him. And that's something that, you know, it's not any of my notes, but they continued to do that even after his fumble. You know, he was fine the next drive. My my first, my second one, Tom, here is Denzel Burke. We talked about him and how good he was. I ended up um, pulling out. I went and looked at every single time he was targeted this season. And he, he gave up. Now, granted, he gave up a catch to Blue Smith in this game, but did, did you happen to see how badly Blue Smith had to push him off to get the catch? He basically has a little, just a little stop route and he shoved Denzel Berg to create some room and then came back for the ball. But that was one. And then, of course, the, uh, the one to the tight end in his own coverage. I'm not going to put that one on him. But in terms of, and I'm just scrolling looking for it. Okay. So in terms of receivers catching passes on him this season, Denzel Berg has been targeted 15 times. He's given up two catches, has four pass breakups, and a fifth that didn't get didn't get cred- credited in the end zone against Youngstown State, has an interception, and a forced fumble. So he has basically created as many turnovers as he has given up receptions. And this dude, uh, you know, it's going to be another test on Saturday, and we talked him up after the game as well. But I just wanted to go back and look to see exactly how many times he's actually given up catches and and how effective he's been because. Uh, quarterbacks continue to test him and he continues to pass those tests. Yeah. And he's not just, you know, barely scraping by, this is not a uh, D is for diploma, you know, pass those tests either. That is he's, he's been very effective and he's been good at being physical without actually getting called for it. And that's one of those things where that's a real, real fine line. Cause you'll see, you know, Hey, the guy has an arm around the shoulder as he's reaching over and that gets called. But if you don't have the armor on the shoulder, draped over the shoulder, and you're still coming around the body the same way, a lot of times it doesn't get called. Jordan Hancock had a couple of those as well. I think Hancock might've gotten called for, or Hancock got called for one, but I don't think it was that kind of contact. But, you know, both of those guys, you're seeing that kind of move. And Davis Nigbenosen felt like he didn't get thrown at at all. So we really didn't see much of Davis Nigbenosen uh, throughout the, throughout the game, but it was, you know, that Malachi Corley is a good receiver and, you know, Hancock was on him most of the day. You saw him out of the slot a lot, but yeah, those, those corners are all playing pretty physically. You've seen teams do that against Ohio state and boy, when they do it against Ohio state, it sure does feel unfair, huh? Doesn't it friends at home, it, you know, but they're cheating They're you know, they, they're just taking advantage of the fact that the refs can't call it all, you know, on every play like, well, you know, that, that works both ways. You can be a physical corner. Davis Negbenosen has been a very physical corner this year. But it feels like, you know, Burke and and uh, Hancock are kind of in that uh, in that realm as well, where they're you know they maybe push the line a little bit. But if your technique is good and you don't get sloppy and you don't get obvious and you know get the obvious jersey tug or the you know twist the guy around, you you can get away with being a little more physical. And they're extremely physical in the run game too, which is really impressive. And we've seen both Hancock and Burke force fumbles after the catch or after the run, so. They're physical everywhere. And I think when you're physical everywhere, you kind of get, you, you're allowed to, to be physical in more places. 
Yeah. And, you know, I'll transition to my next one. And this is someone else who was physical at times on Saturday. That was Josh Proctor. He was, you know, there was at one point where he was in one-on-one coverage downfield against Malachi Corley. And I looked at that and I went, "Mm, I don't know if that's the matchup they would have drawn. You know, I wonder if that was Western Kentucky manipulating some personnel to, to get the matchup they wanted. And there was some contact downfield, but wasn't called. But Josh Proctor was very, he was aggressive as always. And that's sort of always been his MO. He kind of jumped a route early in Western Kentucky's first drive. I mean, it was a really nice play, but it was just, I, you know, I wrote down like, oh, you got to be a little careful with that. You can't get too aggressive with that kind of stuff. But he just, he was overall, I thought, pretty solid. He was, you know, that, that adjuster position was one that we went into the season thinking, you know, we, we, I think we thought Jihad Carter was going to be that guy or that, you know, it sounded, you know, they were talking about it like Jihad Carter was going to be that guy. And then all of a sudden it's Josh Proctor at the start of the year. Okay. I went, huh? All right. But he's been really solid. And that was the game against Western Kentucky where you knew they were going to throw the ball a lot. And that's where, you know, is one going to, is one going to get thrown over his head? And no, they never got thrown over his head. And, uh, part, you know, part of that may be the pass rush and, uh, dibs on talking about the pass rush next. You can take whatever else you want, but, uh, dibs on the pass rush next. But, you know, that was, that was one of those like, okay, let's see if he passes this test kind of games. And he did. He was, he was really solid. And, you know, it'll be a different challenge, uh, against a different veteran quarterback this weekend. But, you know, so, so far, so good on the Josh Proctor thing, I think. Yeah, we'll stay in the Josh Proctor realm for my next one. And I agree, he was really good. There was one portion where um, he made a stop near the backfield, at the, near the line of scrimmage against the running back. And the play-by-play guy goes, CJ Hicks is in on the tackle because, you know, he sees the one and assumes it's an 11 or whatever. He, and, and that's because Josh Proctor hits like a linebacker, and that's what he did there. But there, there was one play, and this takes me to my point, that uh, – even though we have talked about Jim Knowles having a, um, a renewed philosophy on not needing to be so aggressive all the time, and people were wondering, does that mean he's not going to be aggressive at all? No, because he was still blitzing two linebackers on some third and longs, and one of those was a third and ten late in the first. I think it led to a, eventually a touchdown drive or a scoring drive, but he sent six, and Josh Proctor was kind of – Hanging out and it was kind of was um, just frozen by a, a restraining a restraint uh, route as a tight end just kind of hangs out towards the backfield as a as an H and a wing while Malachi Corley takes a slant inside of Proctor and then the pass gets to Corley for like a 17 yard gain. It's a really nice play because it froze Proctor. He wasn't able to defend two guys at once basically, and they were able to pick up that first down, but. That was the only time where I saw Proctor, and it wasn't even his, his fault because, like I said, he was being a constraint, not restraint. But um, like he was watching his man while also trying to help out, and and so that was a great play by them. But I thought he was fantastic all throughout. And the, now my question just becomes: How does he handle the play action against Indiana and Sam Hartman? That's the next test for him. And if he does well there, then I think you've finally gotten the Josh Proctor that has been promised, the Proctor that has been promised since 2018 and this was a, another really good day for him and also for a, an aggressive defense because they did harass quarterback Austin Reed and I'll stop there Tom so that you can continue yeah whoa 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 stay <laughs> stay off the west side it was yeah it was uh it was a really impressive performance from the defensive line and you know it's still not showing up on the stat sheet in terms of sacks but it was very interesting on Monday when uh, Marcus Freeman was asked about his defensive line. And, you know, the the question was essentially, uh, you know, yeah, the defensive line's been been solid, but, you know, they're really not recording sacks. And it was like, hey, wait a minute. Am I I listening to the wrong press conference? What's going on here? But, yeah, the defensive line was really good. And this is – I'm kind of cheating on this one because it didn't take – you know, we we sort of talked about it a little bit after the game, but I really noticed it while I was going through photos after the game because I was like, boy, I have a lot of pictures of – Mike Hall right in Austin Reed's face or JT Tuimoloa right in Austin Reed's face or Jack Sawyer right in Austin Reed's face. Just guys, hands up in passing lanes, guys right in his face, guys get making him uncomfortable. They were, they were really, really disruptive. And, you know, what did he finish? 58% completion, something like that. 56% completion. That's a guy that's normally completing 75, 80% of his passes. Part of that is the secondary and the good play by the corners. But part of that is also just 
those corners don't have to cover as long because there was someone in his face all the time. And when there's someone in your face all the time, you don't have time to run double moves and, and, you know, take advantage of over, you know, aggressive secondary play. You got to just get the ball out. And when you have to get the ball out, you know, it's one, two, go. That makes it very, you know, it's like a pitcher who throws everything one speed. You can, no no matter how fast it is, you can time it up if it's going to be kind of consistent, you know, it has to come out at a consistent time. That makes it very predictable for the, uh, for the secondary. This is something the coaches talk about all the time. The secondary and the pass rush feed off of each other. If the, if the pass rush is good, it makes the secondary better. If the secondary is good, it gives the pass rush more time to get there. And in addition to all that, one of the plays I was most impressed with was JT Tui Molowau, who there was a point where they were going to run, uh, Western Kentucky was going to run like a reverse. And I think it was Malachi Corley had it and he, he took it and, JT Tuimaloa was there right in the pitch lane, right between, you know, he didn't overrun the play. He didn't get a get crazy or aggressive. He looked like he recognized what was going. This is like what we talked about with Chris Jenkins on the Michigan Monday show yesterday, where it was not overly aggressive. It was a veteran player, saw what he saw what was going on, recognized it, stayed in the right spot, and then made a big play. And what happened there was instead of a reverse, then Corley had to just hang on to the ball and just kind of fall forward. And when you're drawing up a reverse in your game plan meetings and you're coaching your scheme meetings uh, on, you know, Tuesday and Monday of the week, you're not thinking, well, I hope we get no gain on this play. Like that, that's when you're thinking, okay, this is going to be good for 15, 20 yards if things break right. And it turned into a no gain. And that was just it. I I don't think he even showed up on the stat sheet with the tackle on that play, but it was a a play that he made just by being responsible, staying in the right spot, and not getting too aggressive. Yeah, I was really impressed by those two guys live and then afterwards as well. And I saw PFF tweet out, I think on Monday, that Jack Sawyer had seven quarterback pressures and JT Tuimolo had, had six. And that's not – the play you're talking about was one of the best plays, and that's not uh, a quarterback pressure at all. It's just – it was a Corley pressure, Tom, and – uh it was a, it was a good one. Marcus Freeman saying that you know, sacks are overrated. I don't even remember his exact words. Like he doesn't. He told told his defense coordinator, coordinator, I don't care about sacks. They'll come. Right now, they have six sacks in four games. They are ranked seventy fourth in the nation in that stat. He said the stat that he cares about that he wants is pass efficiency defense. Right now, they're number one in the nation pass efficiency defense allowing just 5.2 yards per pass attempt as well, which is really good, and also allowing just 44% completions. Now, Navy is part of that, so that is what it is. But um, overall, I was, like I said, I really liked what I saw from Jack Sawyer and, and JT Tui Moilua, and that's also in the run game. They were both really good in the run game, which, um, you know, defensive ends, great job. Kenyatta Jackson had some nice pass rushes, and, of course, Ken Curry continues to be consistent. But the guy that I want to talk about, Tom, next, number 17, Mitchell Melton, who had a sack and a an additional tackle for loss. And that dude was fast around the edge. And quarterback had no chance on his uh, on his pass rush. And I think it was the – I don't even remember if it was running back or um, if it was some sort of a end around or something like that. But the other play, like he's in the backfield immediately, very fast. Uh, this is something that – Larry Johnson has said that his ability, and Jim Knowles as well, his ability to just get low, bend, turn the corner, that was on display in, uh, at the end of this game where he notched his sack and his tackle for loss. And they're not exactly back-to-back, but I think they're maybe in the same same drive or the following drive. But go go check him out because it was very fast, and it looked like the it was linebacker speed, defensive end size, and it, it does make me wonder if we are ever going to see – the Jack, if it's even necessary at this point, if it's something they save, if it's something they don't want to bring into the situation right now because things are going well. But Mitchell Melton as the fifth defensive end in, in the rotation right now, I wouldn't be surprised if he's getting a little bit more time here and there. But everybody's playing really well right now, so who do you take off the field? Right. And, you know, that tends to be one of those situations that at some point somebody's going to get at least a little bit nicked up and maybe maybe have to miss a half or whatever. And then you have, you know, that that's a really good thing to have in your back pocket because he's someone who we've been hearing about for, what, a year and a half now that 
that, oh, wait till you see this guy. He's, you know, he, he's been, he missed, uh, I think he missed the 2021 season, I think. Right. And then, and the 2022 uh, and then, and then got hurt in spring 2022 and you had been hearing about him all spring. And I was like, all right, let's see what this, and then he just didn't happen. And that, that I'm sure was uh, quite disappointing for him in addition to disappointing for Ohio state fans. But yet now that he's out there, you can, you know, you can, sometimes it's like, you hear about a guy, you don't. It doesn't necessarily materialize on the field. That was a yeah, like you're sort of watching and nodding along, like yeah, okay, yeah, I, I see it. It's there. Yep, they weren't kidding. So, if at you know, if the worst case scenario there is that's added depth, it's a fifth guy at the defensive end spot. Yeah, that's great. And then if they end up utilizing the jack at some point later in the year, just based on you know scheme or opponent or whatever, then great. But you know, the, if you're getting the productivity you are out of your defensive end spots right now and it's working, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So uh, let's go on to the next one. I wanted to talk about Kyle McCord and the strip sack. And that was, you know, go, listening back to the post game uh, interviews with him, I felt bad because it was like that he got asked about that a bunch. And it was like, <laughs> he just put 19 for 23 for 300 yards and three touchdowns. And, you know, it's like, well, it was like when Marvin Harrison two weeks ago dropped that one pass and it was like all anyone could ask him about. It. It's like, yeah, we've seen you catch touchdowns before. Tell us about the bad thing you did. But, you know, it, it was one of those things where, yes, you got strip sacked and that's bad. And, you know, he talked about Ryan Day, um, you know, telling him about, you know, reminding him, use, use the third arm, which is you know, get that in close to your body, use your body to kind of protect the ball. But the decision not to throw it, that wasn't necessarily a bad decision. And I, I was thinking about that play when we were watching the Michigan game uh, for the Michigan Monday show we did yesterday, where JJ McCarthy, who is the same class as Kyle McCord, they, you know, they were kind of linked because those were both guys who were looking for Ohio state offers and Ohio state ended up deciding on McCord over McCarthy. So, you know, they, they've been sort of linked in people's minds for a couple of years. Now you saw McCarthy kind of, push it a little bit. And there were times when guys downfield were covered and it was kind of, you know, a little, it was a little YOLO. It was a little bit like, well, we'll see if we can fit this in here. And as we said on that show, they knew they were going to win. It was fine. It wasn't, you know, that was not the time that you had to be, you know, real cautious, but Kyle McCord being cautious in that moment was not necessarily a bad thing. The ball, you know, the ball protection thing is what it is. And that sound, you know, that's something you can potentially get, uh, get fixed, but he did, I think did an okay job in that moment. And then there was later when he had a clear, a, a guy come and clean off the edge. He did not have a ton of guys in his face. The offensive line did a pretty good job with uh, pass protection, but there was a moment in the third quarter where a guy was coming clean off the edge and he recognized it, stayed in there, got the ball out, took the hit. He threw it to uh, Carnell Tate. It looked like it might've been like Tate wasn't quite looking for it yet, but you know, I mean, those are just kind of the little moments where, it's not perfect. He didn't complete the pass to Tate. He didn't hang on to the ball on the, on the sack. But the decisions, I think, were reasonable in both cases. And then it's just, okay, with more reps, get more comfortable, that stuff is going to kind of come. Yeah, Watching that one live, I think I had the receivers backwards when, when we talked about that one in the post game. I'd still like to see a, a better all 22 of it to see because it felt like some – there were. I don't even know if it was Marvin or Mecca was breaking open what he was looking at the other guy. But as I said, after the game, I can't fault a quarterback for looking a little bit too long at those two guys because they're really, really good. And at some point you expect that and not that you're waiting for them to get open, but you want to make sure that there's a window that will be there when you decide to throw. And just sometimes you can't, you, know, you hold the ball too long and that happens. But you know, when Ryan day talks about, the loving it when Justin Fields would throw the ball away, like it was a learning moment and maybe Kyle McCord gets to that point, but you also kind of have to be out of the pocket or else it looks maybe like a, a, um, you know, a grounding call. So you got to be careful what you're going to do there. But in, in the heat of the moment, you just, you held the ball a little bit too long, but I, I'm not, I'd rather you do that than uh, throw an interception, even though it ended in a turnover. And it's one of those things where you, it, eventually get your clock right. Like, okay, I'm taking way too long. And basically you don't know necessarily know that you're taking too long until you've been told by the defense you're taking too long. And so now he knows that and that, that helps the internal clock. So I thought overall 19 of 23, 
He'll take that all day long unless those foreign completions are interceptions. And then, and then maybe not at that point, but just he, he was really good and very confident. And again, I will say the Devin Brown touchdown pass to Carnell Tate was perfection. That was great. I didn't, I, I missed the shoulder dip, the pump fake the first time, uh, watching it live and then seeing the, the double move there. That was all great. Sticking with the offense, Tom, and, and the physicality, Ryan Day said that the, or Justin Fry said the, the message of the week for the offensive line was violence. They were, I thought they were very physical. And this one, I especially was watching Josh Simmons throughout most of this replay just to see how long he was sustaining his blocks and he was sustaining them. Uh, on one of the, one of the runs, he took his guy 10 yards past the line of scrimmage. And so he was, it, it looked like the message resonated with him. Uh, you know, Donovan Jackson had some, some nice blocks in there as well. I think it resonated with everybody and they just, I think they sustained things for more than they did before. And they were creating, um, some lanes and just creating a push, uh, specifically Josh Simmons. And I, um, you know, didn't, I know he was penalized like once for a, uh, was it a false start or something? I don't even remember, but uh, I don't think it's to the point where people are going to start calling him JB Simmons or anything like that, but he, he is getting his one or two penalties per game. But I was, I was still, I liked what I saw from him in this one overall. And it, it's a good time to start getting better each week right now with Notre Dame on the schedule. Yeah. I mean, the lanes, the running lanes seem like they were maybe a little bigger this week. There was, you know, the, Different. I mean, it was it was you know sometimes on stretch or sometimes on uh, you know just some kind of inside power kind of thing, but the lanes just felt like they were a little bigger and guys were hitting them a little more assertively. And I don't know exactly how much credit to give to the running backs versus the uh, offensive line. Obviously, the line is opening the holes, but you know the backs hitting the holes more assertively. Maybe that makes the offensive line look a little bit better. But you know, it just it felt like the run game was much more like what you would expect the run game to look like. And Western Kentucky is not a good run defense at all. And we talked about the fact last week that, you know, you don't necessarily think everything is magically fixed because they got, you know, things went the way they did in the run game. But if they hadn't looked like that, that would have been a concern. So it's like, okay, you know, it's not bad news. It's it's good news in the fact that it's not bad news. And we'll see how good the news is. We'll we'll know a lot more about how good the news is by about eleven o'clock on Saturday night. But you know, right right now it's you know, it feels like tangible another week of tangible progress for the offensive line and for the run game. And they were able to, you know, pick up most of their third and shorts on on the ground, and that was, you know, that was kind of an encouraging sign as well. And again, we'll see what this weekend looks like, but that that all felt like good news based on where things have been the first couple of weeks. Uh, and switch to, switching to special teams real quickly. I, I saw Xavier Johnson get stopped at the 15 on a kick return at one point. And, you know, he had another one that he could get out to the 25 or so. I, I'm wondering, you know, how is Ryan Day going to approach this week in terms of kick returns? Is it going to be fair catch it? Start it with the 15. Don't risk the, you know, don't risk the turnover. Just give the offense the ball at the 25 yard line and see what happens. Or are they going to want to roll the dice a little bit? Are they anticipating a lower scoring game and you want to, you know, if you have a chance to make a big play in the kick game and get the ball out to the 37 yard line instead of the 25, that's worth doing. I mean, you go back to the last time Ohio State played at, at Notre Dame. What was the opening play of the game? Long a kickoff. And a long return by the uh, late, great Demetrius Stanley inside the Notre Dame, what, 10, 15 yard line, something like that, set up a very short opening drive touchdown in that game. I, I can see the argument for that being, you know, something that you, you're going to try. But, you know, I mean, do you have do you have some kind of a special, uh, you know, special kick uh, throwback something or whatever? Like this would be the week you break that out. So I, I can see the argument for play it safe, give the offense the ball. And maybe, you, you know, maybe you play it safe to start with and then you sort of see how the game is going. And, you know, if uh, if it's a little bit of an offensive slog, then maybe you take your, you, you pays your money and you take your chances. Just looking at Notre Dame's kickoffs and 21 of their 31 kickoffs have been touchbacks. I don't know if that counts. The f I assume that counts the fair catches from the, the 15 and things like that. Um, 
but they have given up 26 yards per kickoff return on six returns. Half of that was basically Tennessee State had 76 yards on two returns, so they must have had a, a semi-long one in there. But it is – I was thinking about Xavier Johnson as well in terms of they say he's they, – they like what he does, and he's certainly not the most explosive guy that they have in terms of potential returners. However, he's probably the, the, safest, the safest, most direct Maurice Hall type of – I will get you to the 25, you know, that sort of thing, except for when he does it. The one return where he did, he, he did, did get them to the 25 on one of his returns. But yeah, I'll be interested to see if, um, they, because normally they don't necessarily, they don't do just the fair catch. If it's a touchback into the end zone, that's fine. But normally if it's short of that, they're going to, they're going to go after it. Um, and also in that same area, I think Jaden Fielding has done a fantastic job with his kickoffs, like where they've been because they want to uh, force a return. And so not that you can force it, but they want to allow for a return and see if other team, if the opponent will oblige them. And he has been consistent, you know, maybe, maybe it could be a little deeper, but he's between the, the, the three and the 10 yard line in that corner consistently. And uh, I've been impressed with him. A couple of other things that I have written down here, jotted down, you know, Jordan Hancock gave up some catches in this one. I think this is still a learning process for him and in a relatively new position, even though he's been doing it since camp, it's still a, a different world, especially in the Western Kentucky against the Western Kentucky offense. The touchdown drive for Western Kentucky, a bit of a fluke. Uh, there should have been a holding call on that touchdown pass, that screen pass to Corley. Uh, and I, I don't know why there wasn't. There was some blatant pulling and tugging there. So and that is what it is. And, um, you know, that's, and recover the fumble on, on that. That's the same drive where they forced the fumble, and didn't recover it. So that they, um, they, I guess, is it is it ball don't lie if you mess if you if you fail to recover a fumble that you should have recovered like three times and then that drive ends up and and the defense giving up a touchdown it's like yeah you had your chance but uh i guess the ball doesn't forget perhaps i saw an interesting stat earlier today that Notre Dame has forced nine fumbles this year and recovered zero of them so uh if you have a uh somewhat flawed uh, understanding of uh, statistical uh, methodology, you'll say, oh, well, certainly that will regress to the mean and they will recover and get that back up to uh, 50% very soon. It's like, no, that's not quite how it works, but they will probably recover about 50% moving forward. That's not not the same thing, but you know, odds are generally you're going to recover about half of the fumbles. And, you know, and you'll have teams that have incredibly good fumble luck and incredibly bad fumble luck every year. That does tend to the next year to, you know, trend back towards 50%. That's not, that's not like a uh, real teachable skill that just year after year after year, you see teams defy that. So uh, speaking of fumbles, there you go. Um, the hold at the goal line. Yes. I have a great picture of Davis and uh getting uh, gently guided away from the ball carrier that I, you know, this is one of these things that I used to just, you know, tweet out pictures like that. And then we just get a million angry people like, what are you blaming the refs? Like, settle down. I'm just putting it, it's just a picture. Settle down, Beavis. If I think about it, we'll see if I, th- it's, we'll see if I remember when I edit the episode together. But if I did, if I remembered, you'll be seeing a picture right here uh, on the YouTube channel of David Sidney and being uh, gently, uh, gently uh, held, uh, held and rocked like a newborn baby uh, as the uh, ball goes away from him. You know, as far as other stuff that just kind of last minute stuff, uh, boy, the second quarter of that game, the last eight minutes of that first half, when I'm on the field, I'm just, I'm generally just thinking about like next, you know, where are they? Who's going to be, you know, who do I need pictures of? Who do I, you know, I'm not thinking narrative game stuff necessarily. Boy, watching on TV, that was an absolute avalanche. That just, that you just, you have not seen that from Ohio State yet this year. And, that is a gear that most teams do not have where you're, you're scoring long touchdowns. It was, you know, the one play touchdown to Marvin Harrison, the one play touchdown to Chip Trainum, the two touchdowns to Mecca Buka. You got turnovers in the middle there to shorten drives um, for Western Kentucky. It was, that is a, that is a, a ceiling that most teams don't have. And when you see that, it's kind of like, okay, I know it's Western Kentucky, 
But the fact that that's in there, that is potentially, uh, you know, potentially something that they will need against a better opponent. And, you know, to know that that, that is in there, that's something to just, just file it away that, you know, you don't see that very often, but when you do, it's like, whoa, you don't, you don't see average teams do that. That, that was a eight minutes of holy crap. And that's, uh, that's something that, you know, that, that is a good indication for what the ceiling for this team could be. Yeah. And I mentioned the Josh Simmons, 10 yard block downfield that was, that came on Chip Trainum's touchdown around of 40 yards, which was part of that onslaught of four touchdown drives that lasted all of two and two in time of possession. Uh, that, I think that that covers it for me. That covers it for you. Although it is also fun watching Julian Fleming block dudes on the outside, whether it is a screen or a running play, I will say that just throw that one in there. Yeah. And the, some of the block, it felt like there were a couple missed blocks. Kate Stover might've had one and Mecca Ibuka I know got called for a hold on one and had a guy fight off a block at one point. But yeah, I mean, the blocking on the edge was generally very good. Stover had a couple good ones. Marvin Harrison had at least one really good one on a, uh, on a Travion Henderson run. That's the, that's the little stuff. That's the stuff that turns the eight yard gain into a 20 yard gain. And that's the little stuff you've got to do when you're playing better competition this week, you have to stay on your blocks. You have to not, you know, don't, don't get lazy, stay on your technique. Don't, you know, no. And also know when to let go. You've got to, you've got to let go before it becomes an obvious holding call that sometimes gets made. No one to hold them. No one to fold them. No one to walk away. No one to run. As Tom said. So I want to thank you all for joining us. That, that wraps up our Michigan discussion, our Western Kentucky discussion. Now it it is all Notre Dame from here on out. And on, you know, we're we're going to have some stuff for you. Trust us on that. Well, we're going to, we're going to have plenty of stuff, probably doing a a Notre Dame, North Carolina state rewatch as well to, uh, to discuss that one. And of course, all of the coverage that you normally get from us here at BuckeyeHuddle.com. So if you're watching, if you're listening or watching, go ahead and subscribe, hit the bell to be notified, uh, leave us a five-star rating and review on a podcast platform of your choice if you would like. I want to invite you, as always, to check us out at BuckeyeHuddle.com, also YouTube.com slash BuckeyeHuddle. So thank you all for tuning in, and we'll talk to you guys later.